Hello everyone. So, so far uh, we have been discussing the fundamentals of nuclear chemistry, the all the related topics related to radioactivity, nuclear structure, nuclear models, nuclear reaction, detection and measurement of different types of radiations and also producing different isotopes. Now the remaining part of this course, the remaining five, uh, the five lectures or 10 modules of my portion, I will be focusing on the applications of whatever knowledge we have gained in different branches of science, of course in chemistry as well as other areas. So before that, I would just like to discuss the basic practices in a radiochemical experiment. So we, we, do, we do radiochemical separations, we do radiochemical analysis. What are the practices that we need to follow that we would try to discuss in this particular lecture? Okay, so one of the important radiochemical practice is to do separation. Separation of radioactive isotopes we will call as radiochemical separations. Now we can have different radio isotopes or even in the case of actinides, you know, the entire, all the isotopes are radioactive. So, it, we can also call them as radioactive elements. So, we will, we may be separating actinides or we may be separating a other, other elements for using their radio traces. Now, one of the important advantage of radiochemical separation besides the other methods of physical methods, like in physical methods, you know, we can be using detectors. I explained the other day delta EE telescopes, where I mean you can separate proton, neutron, alpha particles and so on. The moment you go to heavier, heavier elements, you know, this, there is a, a overlapping of the signal due to different elements, Z and A. And so in physical experiments, you will find it is difficult to resolve the different Z and A of the products that are formed in a nuclear reaction or even fission. In radiochemical separation, since we are separating the elements radiochemically and then identifying the mass number by following their decay characteristics like half-life or gamma energy. So the resolution means in terms of neighboring elements you now is unique. We can unambiguously add, assign the Z and A atomic number and mass number to the particular radioisotope produced in a nuclear reaction. That is what I mean by unique resolution in Z and A. Now, what is the need for this radiochemical surface? Where do we come across? So that is what let me just give you the brief introduction. Need for radiochemical surface. So, one is to have the requirement of pure radiochemicals. We will, as we go along, we will see that there are many areas like particularly, you know, when you want to use a radioisotope in medicine, particularly in diagnosis, you require a pure radiochemical. A particular tracer, particularly technetium 99M, bound to a organic molecule and that formulation should not contain any other chemical form. So that is what we mean by pure radiochemicals for applications. Sometimes even in research, you are synthesizing some particular compound, a labeled compound, and you like you like to have this as pure as possible. Then we use radio tracers in many many areas like industry, healthcare, agriculture, environmental research, and so on. And the requirement, of course, in most of the cases, will be we require the radiochemically pure and also this is called radionuclidically pure means only that isotopes will be present, other isotopes should not be present, they may interfere in the experiments. So for, to, for producing this pure radioisotopes, we require radiochemical, radiochemical separations. Then we have the important area of short-lived radioisotopes. Many many elements, the heavy elements, Transactinides, 
whatever the discoveries are happening at the moment in the area of heavy elements, transactinide, half-lives are all in seconds, milliseconds, and microseconds. So you require very nice radiochemical separation, in fact, the very fast radiochemical separations so that you can identify the ZNA of these isotopes. So again, that same thing I have mentioned also, chemistry of heavy elements. If you are studying the chemistry of heavy elements, from the time of nuclear reactions, their production and separation involves very fast radiochemical surface. The short-lived isotopes are also many, many applications in there, like for example in PET, positron emission tomography to produce F18 or carbon-11 or oxygen-15. These are very short-lived, some of them even seconds. And for the positron emission tomography study, diagnostic applications, you require, after they are produced, you require them to be sent to the hospital as early as possible. So they require the fast radiochemical separation. So radiochemical separations have evolved a long lot over the last many, many years. And I'll just try to give you a glimpse of that evolution. So before uh, we go to the different types of radiochemical separations and the applications, let me try to give you the basic principles. The basic principles that we follow in any radiochemical separation. So whenever we are doing radiochemistry experiments, we need to take care of certain aspects and certain uh, terminologies we use so that you know you, you know what is that purpose of the particular. Term. For example, we say carriers. So in radiochemistry, radiochemical experiments, Carrier actually is the stable isotopes of the element of the radioisotope. So we, we are using a radioisotope as a tracer for radiochemical separations. So to want to trace the path of a uh, radioisotope, a radio element, or you produce a radioisotope in a chemical reaction, maybe fission or a reaction, and you have very few atoms of that particular radioisotope. So if you want to do separation, probably you need to carry that few atoms with a bulk material. So that bulk material made of the same element but different isotope stable ones we call as the carrier. And this carrier in fact are meant to minimize the loss. If you have let us say 1 million atoms of an isotope like iodine 131 you produce by tellurium, suppose you, you have tellurium 130, tellurium 131, tellurium okay, 130, 131 tellurium and this is mixed with beta minus 2 131 iodine I discussed the other day in the radio astro production. Now this iodine 131 is carrier free that means only 131 iodine isotopes are there. So if you have a curie of 131 iodine you may have about billions or maybe 10 billion something for 10 11 atoms of iodine 131. So when you do separation in terms of the amount, you know, 131 gram will contain a dot number. So then for 10 atoms will contain only picogram um, you know, of quantity. So you cannot handle such a large small quantity. In fact, when you put them in a container, many of them will get absorbed onto the wall of the container. So minimize the loss due to adsorption or other, you know, in, in the reagents. It's better that we use bulk potassium iodide. So you use iodide, iodine-127 to carry this 131 iodine. So the losses will be minimized. Many a times we require them in a high specific activity. So you don't add a bulk quantity. You need add macrogram quantity. That power 20 atoms or 25, 18 atoms. So like that, we try by because of the Bass effect. So you generate large quantity, not, not that large, but relatively large to why the loss during radiochemical separation? Then there is a term called holdback carriers. So suppose along with the tellurium, you have other isotopes. For example, in fission, you have 131 iodine, you have 132 tellurium. They are fission products. Now both of them are carrier free, means only atoms of these radioactive isotopes are present. And we want to separate 131 iodine as fission product but we don't want to separate 132 tellurium. So for iodine, we may use Ki as a carrier, but to prevent the, some portion of tellurium going into along with the 131. Suppose you do precipitation. 
silver iodide. Then there is a possibility that 132 terrarium may get adsorbed onto the precipitate. So to prevent that absorption or we may do solvent extraction of iodine in carbon tetrachloride to prevent the carry forward of tellurium in that extraction, we use some stable tellurium, telluric acid you can use, so that, that the, this isotopes of tellurium which are radioactive, they also remain in the raffinate. So that is one way of, you know, so these are hold back, they hold the radioisotope in the so place where we don't want, we don't want them to carry along with the separation. And the third type of reagents are called scavengers to precipitate unwanted elements before we separate the desired element. So we use these scavengers or the reagents to separate, to precipitate the elements which are not required to be carried forward along with the, like for example, you want to, you want to separate barium as barium sulfate or barium nitrate. But along with barium, no, many rare earths may also go, zirconium may go. So how to prevent that they also, they don't go along with barium. You can do a ferric hydroxide precipitation. So you add ferric nitrate or ferric chloride and, and ammonia to precipitate all the rare earths and zirconium as hydroxides. And so now whatever is the definite, you add barium, the, the reagent sulfate or nitrate and you can separate barium in the, this form. So these are called scavenger. They scavenge the undesired elements from separation along with the desired element. So these are mostly required for precipitation or solvent extraction or even ion exchange separation. Now one of the important parameters for the radiochemical separation is the half-life. Half-life is very important because sometimes the half-life may be short and your time of separation may be long. So you may lose the whole radioactive isotope. Before it is decaying, you have to separate. Radiochemical purity is, uh, as the name itself mentioned, that what is the form in which the particular isotope is present in the chemical form. That is called the radiochemical. And the purity of that radiochemical, so the, not only the isotope, but the chemical form. So if you are present for you want iodine as iod uh, iodide, you want iodine in presence of as in the form of iodide, not as iodate. So iodine present as I minus is the radiochemically pure form desired, and iodate is a different radiochemical form which is undesired. So you would have to produce iodine 131 as I minus, not IO3 minus in a particular application. When you need IO3 minus, then you require pure IO3 minus. I, I minus will be impurity. Radionuclidic purity, as the name suggests, one third like molybdenum 99 is a radionuclide, and you want to separate this one. But any other radionuclide, any other isotope of even molybdenum is will be taken as an impurity, like molybdenum 93, molybdenum 101. So they are presence of them in the molybdenum 99 fraction will call radionuclide impurity. So, when you say radionuclidic purity, is the fraction of only molybdenum 99 in the total molybdenum present in that particular consignment. Also, the specific activity is an important parameter. You require high specific activity in some applications that you define in terms of activity per unit mass, bacterial per gram or curie per gram. So, you depending upon the application, you may have to go for high specific activity or may not be required at times. And lastly, the radiochemical yield. Many a times so you, you, want, you are doing radiochemical separation. What fraction of that isotope has got separated in your final fraction? So you started with, let us say, 10 curie of that particular activity. And at the end, you get 9 curie of present in that chemical form. So you can say radiochemical yield is 90%. So this, this, this is required to be known. And for that, sometimes radio testers are also used. In radiochemical separations, radio testers help in finding out the radiochemical yield. So you can add a radioisotope, which is not present in your sample. And finally, you see what percentage of this activity has been separated. That will give you the yield of radiochemical separation. <clears throat> so radiochemical separations involves, there, there are all, most of the elements you will find 
there will be a requirement to do radio chemical separation at some point or other. So, if, for example, you are producing iron cobalt, you radiate some targets of iron cobalt, nickel, and produce some isotopes of them. And you may suppose you have an alloy and you want to separate a particular isotope, you need to do radio chemical separations. You may require to, like actinides you want to separate from each other or lanthanide you want to separate each other. You know, one of the classic example of radio chemical separation when you have a large number of radioisotopes present together is fission products. You irradiate uranium with neutrons, you get hundreds of cell products, the half life ranging from seconds to no, years. So you have the fission products starting from let us say selenium, yield of selenium may be 0.01% or so, and the yield is going up, it is reaching maximum around molybdenum, and then it is again goes minimum around cadmium tin, cadmium indium tin 0.01%, goes up, it becomes maximum around cesium barium, and then finally goes down again with the errors. So this all these fission products, you know, and now of course we have the high resolution gamma spectrometry setup. So you can directly see the gamma rays of the fission products. See a large number of fission products you can see together in a gamma spectrum. But earlier, when we didn't have the high resolution gamma spectrometers, we used to do the chemistry of each element. So much so that we remember the chemistry of each element, how to separate, for example, you do you do iodine immediately do solvent extraction in carbon, right? So convert to iodine, do separation. You require antimony, make the hydride, distill it. You require ruthenium, make it tetra, ruthenium tetra oxide, distill it. So depending upon the chemical property of that element, you can find out a any chemical separation procedures. Rare earth, they form very stable fluorides. Fluoride followed by hydroxides. Two, three cycles and you get pure all rare earths in one. So are all across the periodic table, depending upon your requirement, you will find you will have radio chemical separations required for these elements. The heavy elements, transactinides, you see here from here, 104, 5, 6, most of them, the chemistry is not known and their chemistry with regard to their lighter homologs are studied, how they compare like other sodium and hafnium. So you can you can use the lighter homologs as tracers to study the chemistry of heavy elements. So let us discuss some of the radiochemical separation procedures. For example, you do precipitation. Precipitation also can be done in different ways. One is the direct precipitation. You can take just an example. I was discussing rare earths. You want to separate all of them are trivalent except cerium, which can be present as cerium four. All others are trivalent, and so this trivalent rare earths can be separated by a cycle of hydroxide followed by fluoride. So fluoride precipitates of rare earths are clear cut. So they are very fine, low volume. Only zirconium may interfere, and so you can you can do steps of fluoride and hydroxide precipitation. Zirconium will be there all along. So you can do gamma spectrometry. You can separate or you have to go for some complexing agents. They are called, again, they can complex one metal ion, keep it in the solution form while others remain in precipitate. So rare earths can separate the chlorides. Strontium barium separations are very, because strontium is pure beta emitter, strontium 90 and barium. So if you want to separate them, you first dissolve, then you, you, you first make precipitate as nitrates, then you do direct hydroxide scavenging to precipitate out the rare earths, zirconium, other things, and then you separate barium and strontium. Barium goes as barium chromate, and strontium will not precipitate as strontium chromate. Similarly, silver can be precipitated as silver iodide, famous your silver chloride, silver iodide. So there are many more examples. I am just taking some of them. Other than this direct precipitation, there are cases like. You, you can adjust the oxidation state of two elements and separate them. For example, cerium and zirconium, both are tetravalent and they precipitate as iodate. If you want to separate cerium from zirconium, cerium can be reduced to ceric, ceric, cirrus, ceric to cirrus by a suitable reducing agent and then you can separate zirconium as zirconium. zirconium remains as iodate, cerium comes in the solution. So, by playing with the oxygen state, you can do decommutal separation. 
one of the very innovative idea is to do isotopic exchange with the preformed precipitate so you don't have to add the precipitating agent afterwards and this is required when you have a very short lived isotope for example for 138 cgm very short lived half life so 138 cgm you want to separate you don't have much time maybe within 5 minutes you have to separate so you what you do not even 5 minutes actually one or two minutes so you can precipitate you can prepare a precipitate or cgm with silico tungstic acid stable element precipitate and you the solution containing cgm like fission product solution you just add shake it for a few seconds and precipitate so what will happen there is a stable cgm in the precipitate of cgm silico tungstate 138 cgm will exchange isotopically with this one in a few seconds you will find most of the cgm 138 has been precipitated with the cgm silico tungstate so you can just filter this precipitate and you get most of the cgm 138 in the precipitate so that is called isotopic exchange with the preformed precipitate similarly for technetium this for the technetium you know technetium doesn't have any stable element stable isotope but perchlorate chlorine perchlorate ion and tco4 ion are quite close in similar in, in chemistry so if you have perchlorate precipitate of tetraphenyl arsenium so this is the precipitate so instead of technetium we use perchloric acid and precipitate this out and again this precipitate you exchange with technetium so technetium 99 can be precipitate as a tetraphenyl arsenium perchlorate so this is like a co precipitation and very fast you can do ready chemical separation then you have the solvent extraction it is a very common one of you will you will be knowing that a metal ion let us say in aqueous phase and there is a ligand in an organic phase so when you mix aqueous and organic phases both liquid phases together and you you shake them vigorously the because there is a pot potential for the metal ion to complex with ligand and which remains in the organic phase the metal will go to the aqueous phase in the interface uh, organic phase in the interface complex with ligand and the metal ligand complex stays soluble in the organic phase so you can extract the metal ion from aqueous to organic and you can then find out what is the what we call as the distribution coefficient of metal ion into organic phase with respect to aqueous phase the concentration is organic upon concentration in aqueous is called the distribution coefficient and suppose you are separating two metal lines they will have their own d value so the ratio of the d value of a and b is called as the separation factor so you can find out separation factor for the separation of metal lines in the solvent extraction just to give you an example you want to separate iodine fission product iodine iodine is formed in fission in many oxidation states so what you do you first bring all the iodine to i minus using thiosulfate as a reducing agent and now you oxidize i minus to i2 so all the iodine using bromine so now the, all the iodine is now present in the iodine molecular iodine which can be solvent extracted into the carbon tetrachloride so this is how you can do you can do separation by solvent extraction similarly uranium plutonium or you can separate them by a reagent called 30% tributyl phosphate in an organic solvent like dodecane or kerosene aqueous phase is three molar nitric acid and they have very high distribution coefficient the all of them will go in the organic phase so there are many reagents that are used for solvent extraction to dithiol hexyl phosphoric acid tributyl phosphate phenyl trifluoroacetone tri and octyl phosphine oxide dithiol ether methyl isobutyl ketone and so there are many many reagents you know which are commonly used to do solvent extraction of metal ions from aqueous to organic and later on as a function of different acidity you can strip them back in aqueous form so the distribution coefficient depend upon the acidity of the aqueous phase and the concentration in the, the, the particular ligand in the organic phase so you have to play with the acidity to do the separation similarly ion exchange resin ion exchangers are very common reagents for separation of different species so again it is based on the partitioning of the solute between a stationary phase that is the resin and a mobile phase a mobile phase is the acid or it can be a base or it can be a containing complexing agent 
you can have resins based on cation exchange or anion exchange so like for example you have a polymeric base styrene or divinyl benzene on which you have the anchored the groups functional groups like sulfonate and you have the uh, the sulfide group and you have the H plus so it is a neutral species but the S plus is exchangeable so the metal ion in the S, S, in the mobile phase can exchange with the H plus and the metal ion will be retained in the resin H plus will be released in the case of anion exchange resin the the this quaternary ammonium salts containing chloride as a counter ion are exchanging that so you can have the anions exchanging with chloride and you have the anion retained in the column chloride being released so you can you can have this uh, ion exchange from different acidic media hcl hno3 hclo4 h2so4 and so on but the important thing is that depending upon the ionic potential the metal ions are retained by the resin and then you can do separation just for example you want to separate thorium from uranium so you can have nine exchange resin dox1 cross 8 put keep all uranium thorium in 6 to 8 molar hcl wherein uranium forms anionic species but thorium does not form anionic species so in the anionic resin uranium will be held up whereas thorium will not be held up so you can just wash the column all thorium comes in the effluent and you can later on elute uh, uranium by using a dilute acid Similarly, the individual rarals can be separated using a diode 50-plus four cation exchange resin. You take all of them in 0.1 molar HCl, so dilute acid. So the, since H plus is not competing, all the rarals will be held up in the column. And now you want to elute them individually. So there is a beautiful reagent called alpha hydroxy isobutyric acid, which will complex these different rarals. And since the stability constants are different for different rarals, no. You will find because of the rarest ions having different ionic potential, hence different stability constant. By eluting with this particular reagent, reagent individual rarest will come one by one. The one the lowest radius, ionic radius lutetium will come first and lanthanum the last. Another just similar to ion exchange resin, you have extraction chromatography. So here the ligand actually is a on the solid surface. So you have a solid face, stationary face, solid face, some ligand absorbed onto an inert support that form the column, stationary face, and mobile will face will contain the metal ions in presence of H plus, OH minus, and so on. So you have a solution containing metal ion and you have a ligand absorbed onto the solid support. If you pass the solution of metal ion through this column, the metal ion will complex with the ligand and get retained by the column and later on you can elute that one. Just to give an example of very careful separation of zirconium hyponium, zirconium hyponium are very you know chemically very similar because of their similar ionic radii and being in the same group. You can you can separate them using extraction chromatography. This is one example the tricaprylyl monomethyl ammonium chloride called aliquid 36 is a extractant absorbed onto this solid support and then you you first load it from a dilute acid elute hafnium with 8 molar HCl and zirconium with 2 molar HCl. So you can see here this I have taken from this paper that zirconium and hafnium are very well separated. This is hafnium, this is zirconium. So well separated the peaks due to two metal ions in the ion exchange in this extraction photography system. Now lastly let us discuss the Fast radiochemical separations. Many a times you require the half lives are very short, seconds, milliseconds, and so on. To even you know less than a minute is a very you require very fast chemistry. And so there are techniques like gas jet transport system. The gas jet transport system, what you do, you have a beam, so you are doing experiment in the accelerator. The beam is going here, you have a target here. Now the target is thin enough that when the beam falls on target. The products are formed in this chamber and the helium gas is passed through this chamber. The helium gas will transport all of them reaction products to the fumewood in your dump. So you have a pneumatic system and all the reaction products will go in the fumewood. You can collect the gases, the products in a solution 
do the chemistry. So the transport time for the reaction products from the reactor or accelerator to the fume hood becomes a few seconds, one or two seconds. And then the chemistry also you have very fast chemistry apparatus you can do. Other one is the pneumatic carrier facility. The pneumatic carrier means this is the rabbit. You have a rabbit capsule. This capsule, the target is not in the fixed in the beam, beam, but you have the target is fixed in the, you irradiate the capsule. This is containing the target, like in a reactor, no? So this is a, this is a reactor and neutrons are everywhere. You have a pneumatic tube through which you, you take the capsule here, irradiate for some time and later on carry it to the fume. So you have to break open the capsule and the target is present in the capsule. You can separate the reaction product from the target. So here you have only the reaction products in gadget transport system. You have here, you have the target also. So this is a typical pneumatic carrier facility in the Dhruva reactor, what colleagues have built, where you can carry the rabbit in the fume hood into the chemistry. So some of the examples of fast chemistry like antimony, tin, tellurium, you can form hydrides. Within a few seconds, you can separate them. Isotopic exchange with preformed precipitate, solvent extraction. Even you can in accelerators, you know, for proton beams, you can accelerate, you can radiate in the air. Similarly, for heavy elements, you can do rapid chemistry, automated rapid chemistry apparatus. So you have a gas jet transport system followed by the high performance liquid converter graphene. And one of the elements like, you know, dubnium 105 was separated by this ARCA system using a gas jet system. And you can do, you can switch between different uh, columns to do separation of different elements. So, Atom at a time chemistry means at a time only one atom is formed. So you do thousands of chemistries to do the separation of large number of times. And then that is how you study the chemistry of this element. So thermodynamic quantities of heavy elements are determined by doing chemistry thousand times where you have at a time only one atom. And lastly, you have the PET positron emission tomography. You require short lived proton emitters like chlorine 18, carbon 11 and so on. So you can, you have to have very fast rate emitter separations because the half lives are very short. So like for example, FAT from H2O, you have H2O, you irradiate H2O with the protein beam, proton beam, and then you separate FAT from this irradiated water, water using a particular precursor and the catalyst. So this is the reaction given to prepare this F18, FDG. Then you have to have a fast chemical separation where within you know few minutes the whole F18 labeled with the glucose molecule is separated from the irradiated target that is H2O18. So the whole module, whole system is a very compact form, and you do you, you can supply the radiochemically pure and sterile sample to the hospitals in a very reasonable frame of time maybe few minutes time you can do this. So I will stop here. Next I will take the radio electrical techniques and their applications. Thank you very much.